Dave, welcome to the Tech for Non Techies podcast. Thank you so much for joining me on Cinco de Mayo when I am the last person to stand between you and Margaritas. You are a hero. So, last time we spoke, I got very excited about your background in gaming. And you used to work at Electronic Arts. Could you tell people who don't know about EA what it is and why it's such a big deal? Sure. Uh, Electronic Arts, uh, EA, uh, is one of the largest uh, game publishers on the planet. So I think uh, at the time I worked there, they had uh, 24, 26 titles. A title meaning like uh, FIFA, uh, the soccer game, the football game, or uh, uh, Battlefield, which is made by a studio in Sweden called DICE. So EA is the large publisher and under a publisher, you have individual game studios that are actually making the games. So the, the studio that I worked for or worked at was called BioWare. They still exist today. They're very uh, a legendary gaming uh, producer. Uh, and the titles uh, that we made are still on the market today, starting with uh, Star Wars, The Old Republic, Anthem, um, Dragon Age, uh, Mass Effect, which is my my favorite series uh, uh, game. But uh, bottom line is I, I kept a lot of kids on the couch when I worked there and, and some adults too. So how does it work in terms of, let's kind of maybe draw some parallels with Hollywood, because I think maybe that's what most people would know that there would be like a kind of Metro Gold MGM. And then underneath that, they would hire a bunch of people to work in specific movies. Is, are they kind of like the MGM or are they the holding company that owns MGM and all these other places? They're kind of like the MGM. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and, that, and that gets to one of the points that I, I wanted to bring up today is that when you talk about hiring the different uh, types of people in the roles, it's, it's very similar to making a movie. So it's mm -hmm. interesting you bring up uh, MGM. But if you look at the people that are making a game and the diversity of that group, I think a lot of companies could benefit from that type of diversity. And this, especially when we talk about innovation, these mm -hmm. ideas are coming from everywhere. So in gaming, you have producers, writers, artists, musicians, programmers, testers, and this whole group has to come together to make magic happen at the end of the day. And it's a, it's an amazing uh, group and a, an amazing experience. So this sounds like an absolute dream of a workplace. Like you've got these creatives and you're coming up with things that people love all around the world. And I have a great admiration for the gaming industry, although I don't know much about it, but I've always been quite surprised by how little it gets covered in the business press, in the tech press, but it's absolutely massive. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's I, I agree with you. I don't think it's taking taken seriously, especially uh, in the context of business decisions or creating an economy or technical solutions to very complex problems. They're the best. Uh, it, it is unbelievable. But if you look at if you were going to uh, transition to uh, maybe a, a, a financial services company they would initially think there would be nothing for that person that they could do there. And that's a mistake. Uh, from the technical side, uh, solving very difficult problems that exist, not just in gaming, but in many industries, but they've solved them in, in gaming. And one of my favorite examples I like to use is ever go to a, a college football game and you get into the stadium and you can't send a text because there's 50,000 people there. Well, Imagine creating a, an experience where there's 5 million people trying to do the same thing. Gaming solved that. And every time I'm at a football game, I'm like, they need to get some gaming engineers here because this is a solvable problem on scale. Uh, so technical solutions like that, that go across industries, uh, they've nailed anything to deal with latency or just the response time of something. Imagine that you're playing uh, a game with someone in another country on the furthest part of the planet that they could be from you, and it seemed everything seems instant online. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen by accident. And while some people might say, "Well, that's a that's a unique uh, situation for games," 
No, it's not. You, you want responsiveness in your mobile apps and your web apps and all your online experiences. It's not limited to games. I mean, that's really making me think of um, trading flaws. I recently yeah. met up with a friend of mine who creates, who is a really senior software guy at a major trading company. And mm -hmm. this is literally one of the things that he was talking to me about is that they have to execute trades from literally all around the US. And okay, the, it's one country, but it's a big country with large financial transactions. And it kind of sounds a bit similar. Am I correct there? You, you are correct. Uh, both the, the quantity of transactions and then uh, the data, the data itself. We're talking hundreds of millions of records uh, happening a day, in some, in some cases, billions. So to be able to capture all that uh, and not lose anything and to generate insightful metrics from that, games have been doing that for decades. And so now we have like, you know, AI is like on, on, on every email that you get now and it's the hottest mm -hmm. thing. And we, we were doing that stuff and machine learning and things way back 10 years ago when I worked there. And they would generate uh, insights that would be useful for the business. Like I can tell if you're about to quit. I can tell if you're about to spend money. And if you're about to quit, I'm going to hit you with a promotion that will be uh, an incentive to get you not to quit. Mm -hmm. And our success rate was like 80% on, on stuff like that. So going through massive, massive amounts of big data and generating insights that are going to help the business, they've been doing it. Interesting, because what you're talking about, I mean, e-commerce absolutely loves that. But would you then say that essentially the gaming industry, that's like the hotbed of innovation, and then everybody else basically copies it? Or is that too much of a stretch? It might be too much of a stretch. There, there is innovation in uh, a lot of industries. There, there isn't a, a, a corner on that market. Like in my role now, I'm in uh, with a lot of companies advising them on modernization and things that they can do for using technology for business advantage. Uh, and I learned from all of them. And uh, some of the things that I share with them come from gaming, but I take pieces from all of them that I share with others that, that are also helpful. So it happens everywhere. But I think uh, it is required to happen in gaming, or they or they die. And um, can you tell us about some of the innovations? You know, some of the maybe features or innovations that we're now really used to that actually come from gaming. Uh, well, one of the things that is certainly popular uh, is gamification, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, but the, the thing about it is, is there's a, there's a, a strong uh, misperception that gamification is about making something fun. Mm -hmm. Well, making games, uh, a game has to be fun for it to be success successful and fun is hard. There, I mean, it's hard to reproduce even when you nail it, right? But on the, on the gamification side, uh, first of all, it doesn't apply to everything. There is, if, if, if the IRS hired, hired me and said, I need you to make doing the taxes fun, I'd be like, I, I quit. It, it's impossible, right? There's a, there's a professor from uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Jesse Shell, who has a quote that says, you can't put chocolate on a stapler and make it taste good, right? You just, you just can't. And so it's not necessarily about fun. It's about engagement and being involved in something that's bigger than you. And how do, you, how do you create that? And so you see things that where they make attempts and they're very poor attempts like badges and promotions and things like that. And those, are, those aren't sticky. Those are, those are like churning through stuff, but it's not creating that sense of real engagement like they're able to in, in some of these games. So they're trying to take that, that parallel to other industries and like, let, hey, we have to have gamification in our app. Uh, but very few of them pull it off in a way that as a user of the app that I want to do that and I find it fulfilling. Uh, one of the best examples is uh, uh, of a good example is an app called Pain Squad where they used, uh, and this is an application that uh, a mobile app that kids who have cancer that are going through treatment, they go in multiple times a day and they put in their pain scores, right? And so they would get different levels of, of uh, rank 
uh, and they would do that and other, other kids could see their ranks and they could compare. But here's the thing that made it the emotional tie that made it the, the, the gamification work. They're fighting cancer. They're putting in their scores thinking it's gonna help other kids because mm -hmm. the researchers are gonna use this, right? Now you have something that is emotionally engaging and I feel like I'm doing something bigger than me. That's how you do it. If you couldn't do it on a tax form, right? You just can't, it doesn't apply to everything. And that's the thing that I think most people will get wrong. What an absolutely beautiful example. And so why do you think then people from the gaming industry, as you say, are underestimated? And why is this fantastic industry just not getting coverage? When I don't know, I find it interesting. Surely I'm not the only person. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think, uh, by the way, within the gaming industry, uh, they there's a lot of, of respect for all game companies, right? So that was one of the things that I learned when I was new to it. I worked there 11 years, and that is it's like it's like a musician. They'll appreciate good music no matter who made it, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with a game that you even though you're competitors, and we believe that the the the, the gamer only has a certain amount of money they can spend on games, and you want them to choose yours. We loved other games that were well done and people loved ours. And so that in the community itself, it's strong. Uh, outside of that, I think there needs to be more uh, sharing at like conferences on some solutions that, and not game conferences. These could, these could be business conferences or cloud conferences and things like that to get the gaming companies to do more outside of their own comfort zone and their own uh, markets. And I think that would that would help too because right now, uh, even when I meet new people, they're like, I had I had no idea that you know these things were being done in gaming and why why isn't like uh, some of the big pharma stuff and you know drug research doing some of these cool things that you talked about with the big data? Well, they are. We hear about those, right? Uh, you just don't hear about them as much in the on the gaming side. I want to also that you know the people who are commissioning the programs are basically kind of a bit old and snobby and then they don't think Probably. it's serious and so then they essentially don't end up covering but yeah. tell us what is it that you do now and how did gaming preclude that uh well what i do now is i'm chief innovation officer uh for a company called growth acceleration partners uh we help companies modernize for business advantage and so my gaming background helped me a lot uh, because we're we're helping customers like make some really difficult decisions about technology and how that's going to impact ROI, always tying it back to business benefits, right? Well, I did some of the most modern stuff ever when I worked in gaming. And so I was like, hey, I can help other people by sharing, like we were talking about earlier. I can share with other companies and other industries some of these things that I think are going to move the needle for them, regardless of what industry that they're in. So I, I, I made the move because I thought I could get further reach and help people be successful with their business by applying some really modern approaches. And could you give us maybe an example of something that you translated from your work in gaming to a traditional business and how that turned out? Uh, yeah, I can think of uh, a couple. Uh, one I can think of is there's a lot of emphasis uh, on getting to the cloud and having a single uh, instance of something working somewhere. And a lot of customers nowadays still have things running in on-prem and customer environments. And they're worried about having like a single point of failure from a cloud-based SaaS application, right? So here's an example of a, of a company that had software uh, installed at customer sites. And it was uh, recommended that they go to more of a SaaS model, uh, which was very uh, uh, difficult and intimidating for them because they're not used to that. But by doing that and embracing the cloud and everything that ecosystem provided, onboarding a customer went from like six months to like six days. How does that, how does that change your business, mm -hmm. right? That's a, a complete game changer. And mm -hmm. you would say, you might ask, well, how does how does gaming have anything to do anything to do with that? It's a you know, we have a game in a central place, and, and we have redundancy around that. And we have a lot of people that hit it, so there's a lot of similarities into the architecture of of that that was helpful. Interesting. So, just for people who don't necessarily know about 
cloud more than that it's not an actual cloud and latency basically is what you're saying that because there are so many people all around the world playing a particular game at the same time essentially the data that you're storing which you're storing in the cloud um, you have to really figure out how those cloud solutions work to make sure that everybody can connect and essentially you don't have a single point where it fails somewhere the server doesn't work the data doesn't get passed and then somebody's character gets killed essentially when that's, they that's, shouldn't have been that's uh that's exactly right and and it has to be architected in a way where you know uh a junior uh, software engineer will architect something not to fail and to, to fortify it, right? Mm -hmm. This will not fail. It can't fail because I've done these things. A seasoned architect or software engineer will design it for failure and say, what happens when this fails? And mm -hmm. now that that is how you build a resilient uh, application for your business. Here's a, here's a perfect example. One of the best models in the world we're doing this type of thing that everybody can relate to right now is Netflix. Mm -hmm. Netflix is the best, right? And they are in AWS. That whole co-opetition thing is always interesting to me, uh, given Amazon Prime Video's number one competitor. Uh, but like five years ago, when a region went down in AWS, uh, Netflix was in that region. When that happened, uh, planes were grounded, uh, ring doorbells became regular sound doorbells and no video and all that stuff ring was out of the same region the only one that 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 we heard about anyway that survived that with no blip was netflix because netflix had redundancy across regions they tested for failure all the time they had beautiful architecture right and it's a perfect example of if something's not available like uh most viewed watch uh, most watch today on your netflix thing you just don't see that Whereas if it was poorly designed, the whole thing would be a black screen, right? The, the, so the way they they built things and they've made them fail and they test under failure, that's a game changer. Interesting. So the insight really here is build and test for failure. So stress test from the beginning. Absolutely. And Make it fail. You mentioned Netflix and gaming, you know, all these fun consumer companies. Is it then fair to assume that the consumer space is so competitive and consumers are so fickle that essentially you have to be at the top of your game when you're in a B2C company? Whereas in B2B, you know, enterprise sales takes ages, like, I don't know, a sales cycle can be like two years. So essentially you don't have to be that good on the design and on the technology. What do you think of that assumption? I like the assumption and I agree with it. Uh, in, in, in gaming, we have the Metacritic rating, right? Metacritic rating is everything. Bonuses are paid out. People are fired. You know, you, you work seven years on a game and you cannot wait to see what is the Metacritic rating going to be because it's going to be for the, yeah. for the uninitiated. Yeah. So if you go to metacritic.com, you've probably seen it for movies where they have like a, a real official reviews and then they have public reviews. So mm -hmm. if you're a game cr critic, you're getting a separate category and it's one to 10. And this is gonna, this is gonna determine how your game does. It's either gonna survive and thrive or it's going to fail. And you can point back to the Metacritic rating, which what other industries have something like that? You know, you, you, you just don't. So everything that we would do through the course of developing a triple A title, big, big game would be driven by what's this going to do a Metacritic score. And if it's going to go down, then we're not doing that. Or if we're going to risk it going down, we're not going to do that. So everything is within the context of Metacritic. Interesting. Um, I wish more B2B companies had some sort of version of <laughs> Metacritic. I do too. Yeah. And you know, you have like uh, you know, reviews on, on different things and uh, whether or not it's amazon.com or with your product and stuff like that. But there's also a lot of uh, nefarious activity around, you know, trying to kill a game with some fake reviews and stuff like that. That's why the user reviews carry much less weight than the actual critique, uh, the game critics. You know, the game, Gamer Magazine will, will offer a, a, a review and they'll be like, it's 7.2. Uh, but a person might get on there. I've been waiting for this game for three years and it's terrible. One, uh, not as important, right? But we look at the, the critical reviews uh, and it, it, is, it is everything.
But you're right. If we had that in other industries, it would make it a lot better and give us something to shoot for. Yeah, well, I mean, I've used some enterprise software that I think, you know, the people who designed it should be sent to jail. But <laughs> that's another point. So you mentioned that you're, you are chief innovation officer. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious, what does a chief innovation officer do? Like, they go fishing a lot and, uh, <laughs> no. uh, well, it depends. Uh, so uh, in my role, it's both inward facing in the company and it's also outward facing with customers. On the inward side, it's sharing uh, some things and driving some projects that we can do to be more innovative ourselves. And it might be around processes. It might be around technology. It's not always around technology, right? It's also about creating an environment that celebrates failure. You cannot have innovation without failure, right? And so we've all worked at companies where if you failed, you got fired, right? And so they don't, they're not innovating anything. They, they, they're just getting by, right? But if you go from, I don't tolerate it to I tolerate it, do I accept it, which is good? Do I actually celebrate it? Well, look at all these things that we did that did not work. Way to go. We learned a lot, right? Good job. Those are the innovative companies, right? And there's a lot of examples, whether or not they're 3M or Netflix or others like that. But to celebrate failures, mostly in a test lab, I'm not talking about a disaster that happens where your service is down. Everybody, way to go. No. You celebrate them or you, you, you do these failures in private before anything goes out in public, but stop, stop scolding people for failing and instead encouraging them. And I think one of my favorite quotes was, uh, I think it was uh, Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook who said her dad, and I could be wrong who this is, but I think it's her, her dad would ask her each week, tell me, tell me two things you failed at this week. And if she didn't have to, he's like, come on. You got to be trying some stuff. And that shaped her the rest of her life, which I think is an amazing, amazing story. So yeah, in internally embracing failure, uh, celebrating failure. Externally, it's helping uh, apply innovation to industries to move the needle for their business. And does that mean essentially investing in projects or getting companies to invest in projects that may or may not work out? Because that's kind of the innovators dilemma right so the innovators dilemma is like okay things are going really well we're fine now well we'll probably fall off a cliff in five years time if we don't move on with the market but then the yep. cfo usually doesn't want to move on with the market because they're like but we're making money now and you've got the super sure. risky thing that might not work there's a, there's a yes there's a great book called uh, 10 stories great leaders tell uh, I highly recommend it. It's awesome. Number one is where we came from. Number two is why we can't stay here. And so when you have a good story about why we can't stay here, hey, uh, our competitors are able to make changes and, and add new features 10 times the rate that we can. Or we have a, a staff that is like three times the size of our competitors who are doing more than we're doing, right? What can we do from like automation and innovation and things like that? When you paint a good picture and you tell a story on why we can't stay here, now you've opened up the opportunity for let's try some things. Now, I'll tell you, things that we recommend uh, for customers, they're scary, right? I mean, it's just like, it, 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 it's scary. Like they, they're very comfortable. This has been working. They've been in business for 20 years and they're solid. But unless they are able to make some changes, and they could be small, they could be big, they're gonna they're gonna, they're limited in their in their future, and they get that. But it's still a scary thing, and that's why they want experts and some people with some experience that have been through it before to help guide them on that on that pretty treacherous path. And so, who do you normally deal with? Is it going to be this? I mean, I'm assuming the CTO, but also is it CEO, CFO, kind of. Yeah. How, like, is it technical leadership and also the actual business leadership? Yes, it's both. And so I just came off an engagement. I can't tell you who it was. A billion dollar company. Uh, most of the interaction through the, I think it was like a, a seven week engagement. Uh, and this was, we're starting from where we are now to let's let's look at North Star and, and where we want to be. Uh, most of that was with the CTO and the team. 
but the uh, main presentation was with the uh, C-suite, uh, CEO, CFO, uh, CIO, uh, and we had to make sure that we could tie any, any innovation or technology recommendations to business benefits. What's this gonna do? Because that's what the CEO wants, right? You're gonna, you're gonna recommend something and we spend $20 million and it looks like it does now, I'm just out $20 million. No, this is what the types of business benefits you're gonna get if you do these things. So we do that, but we also have to convince uh, the technical team that A, they can do it. This is the right thing to do. And these are some challenges that they're gonna have that they don't have today. You're gonna trade your challenges today for some new ones. Mm -hmm. And let's go. And then we would go back to why we can't stay here. Staying here is not an option. But back to your question, C-suite for sure, uh, especially on things that are like pretty big hitting stuff. So I'm assuming that, you know, the people in the C-suite, they are not 25 and that they probably have great business experience, but a lot of them with their traditional businesses they, you know, they're not hugely digitally savvy or these are not digitally enabled businesses right to the core. And so how much do these C-suite people, how much do they actually know about what you're talking about? Uh, it varies, but I will say that I'm, in, I'm, I'm usually impressed. Uh, and it, and, it, and it, goes, it goes both ways. I'm usually very impressed with uh, the knowledge of, of these things with the uh, CEO. And sometimes I'm surprised in the other direction that the uh, CTO is not more technical, right? Uh, so it goes it goes both ways, but I'm, I'm in my experience, I'm probably more on the impressed side with the, the knowledge that they have. And, and I'm like, this guy's CEO of a billion dollar company and he's asking, you know, very detailed questions about chat GPT and, and all these other things about cloud and scaling and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow. I, I didn't expect that. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, they're, they're impressive. And that's good news. And so it basically seems that it's kind of a necessary skill now for the digital age for a, a business person in the C-suite to really understand these technical concepts, which they probably were not taught at business school. I agree. Yeah. I, so I think it's uh, this table stakes at this point. Yeah. And how do they, how, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this, but how do you think they learn? Because uh, if you're the CEO of a billion dollar company, what are you going to do? Take a Python course on the weekend? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think that the, one of the ways that they got to the position they're in is just the natural curiosity. Uh, and most of them are lifelong learners. And so, you know, whereas they might have a definitely a, a deep area of expertise and it might be finance, uh, but they're just their level of curiosity in these other areas that are going to be important for their business. I think they just bite it off. They just do it. I don't I don't think they're taking Python programming classes, but I think they are learning about advantages of cloud and how do I go from on prem to cloud and what is this I hear about this AI stuff and how can I use that for my business? Uh, so yeah, they're doing it. Awesome. Cool. Well, so my last question is that for the people who've heard this and they think, oh God, gaming is so innovative and I want to see what they're up to. Is there a particular website or news resource or a book that you can recommend that, you know, my audience, my audience make mainly business people who want to learn about technology, but you know, don't know all of the tech jargon. So is there some sort of resource, resource on gaming that you'd recommend to them? Uh, not, well, the, the book on uh, Gamify uh, is, is a great one and that has technology stuff in there too. Uh, and the, the author's name, last name is Burke, if I recall correctly. Uh, but also I, I, I would point out that it's like uh, for people that like eating barbecue, right? Uh, I, where I'm in Texas, uh, it, it's religion here. I like eating barbecue, most people do. Uh, so I would, uh, we would get interest from kids in like high school and college. Like I want to join a gaming company. This is like the ultimate, right? And I'm like, do you like eating barbecue? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's like playing games. And they're like, okay. I said, do you want to be out there at four o'clock in the morning in the rain cooking the barbecue for 12 hours? That's making games. And they're like, oh, so I'm like, there's a big difference between playing them and making them. Uh, 
So it's it's a it's a it's a very fulfilling thing when you see something that you built that's on the shelves at Target and Best Buy and, and around the world. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, uh, pain, sweat, and tears uh, in that. Actually, that reminds me of the book. Uh, it's uh, Sweat and Tears. Uh, it is an awesome. Uh, uh, We'll, we'll put it in the in the chat afterwards. Yeah. I think I think it's blood, sweat, and tears, and it's all about the trials and tribulations of the gaming industry. I was going to say it sounds like my life. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry to hear that, but yeah, uh, this is this is a, this is a very uh, insider uh, kind of like a, a a whistleblower type book oh, uh, about blood, sweat, and tears, and it it. it it's accurate, I can tell you that, but it's a, it's a very good read. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I will not stand in your way between barbecue <laughs> and margaritas. Thank, thank you, you for answering my questions today. I had a great time, and uh, please reach out if you have anything else.